Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee from the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We are very excited and proud to introduce Mr. Paul Vermeulen. He is the Vice President of Agronomy and Competitions for the PGA Tour. Paul Vermeulen joined the PGA Tour Agronomy in December of 2006 and is currently serving as the Vice President of Agronomy and Competitions for the PGA Tour. Paul oversees the day-to-day -day management and scheduling of all agronomic activity in the Agronomy Department for the PGA Tour. He is directly responsible for providing the agronomic support for competitions over all six tours within the PGA Tour. Paul was also based out of Southern California for 10 years. He's got his bachelor's degree of science in agronomy from Michigan State and a master's degree of agronomy uh, from Texas A&M. Mr. Vermeulen, good morning. Thank you very, very much for being on the Catalyst this morning. Good morning, and uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be uh, with such a distinguished group. Um, I have, uh, in the past, worked with a lot of clubs in the Southern California region, uh, having been a USGA agronomist in my previous years. So for all of you that, uh, you know, I may know out there in the audience, um, it's always good to reconnect with, with friends. Um, I, am, I am going to be talking about the work <clears throat> that we do. Um, at our PGA uh, tour venues. Um, our department, the agronomy department, um, really works with the golf course superintendents at each of our tournament venues. And we are, we are there to help them prepare for one of our competitions and also to form, if you will, a partnership um, that creates a strong communication link <clears throat> between the superintendent's office and our entire PGA Tour on-site staff so that uh, they have, you know, obviously a front row seat um, in the, in the, uh, administration of our events uh, so they you know they understand our daily scheduling um, and they are in communication with our staff should we have some kind of weather interruption and they also you know uh, are in a position to understand exactly what course conditions you know we would like to have for a professional competition. So before I, before I uh, get into uh, some of that, um, just a, a, a little bit of background, as John mentioned, uh, as vice president of the agronomy department, um, I do have uh, overlapping responsibilities with not only the PGA Tour, uh, but in fact, all six of our tours, the PGA Tour, PGA Tour Champions, the Corn Ferry Tour, uh, which is uh, maybe more familiar as the web.com tour. It was rebranded a couple of weeks ago. Um, I also have duties with our international developmental tours in South America, Canada, and China as well as uh, involvement with our World Golf Championships, the President's Cup, <clears throat> and of course, our um, marquee event, if you will, the Players' Championship here in Ponte Vedra at TPC Sawgrass. Uh, a, little bit of, a little bit of history um, on the PGA Tour, uh, it's, an organization that dates back really only to 1968 um, when it was uh, formed as a organization to administer 
and bundle together, if you will, all of the tournaments that were then on the calendar for touring professionals. The first commissioner uh, was Joe Dye. He uh, came to the PGA Tour after serving as the executive director at the USGA. So obviously he had a very strong uh, background uh, in history in the in the game of golf. He was he was succeeded by Dean Beeman, our second commissioner. And Dean I think has the credit of truly developing the framework for the business plan um, behind the PGA Tour. Dean also was the individual that had the vision. Uh, of the TPC network. Um, and of course, the flagship of the TPC network opened in 1982, which is uh, TPC Sawgrass, the host venue for the Players' Championship. Now in March, uh, Dean was succeeded by Tim Fincham, commissioner. Um, and, you know, the notable uh, accomplishments on Tim's watch certainly uh, were many, but first and foremost, uh, Tim accelerated the uh, charitable contributions that each of the uh, events uh, makes to local charities. And in 2005, uh, the PGA Tour surpassed the $1 billion uh, mark in charitable giving. Uh, we're now uh, working on the third billion, uh, and I think we're going to achieve that goal uh, here in the next year. Um, 2007 saw the beginning of the playoffs, uh, popularly known as the FedEx Cup uh, playoffs, which Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods won the first FedEx Cup in 2007. Uh, more recently, Jay Monahan uh, took over for Tim as the fourth commissioner of the PGA Tour. And in the last uh, two years, uh, under Jay, we've been, of course, working on the successful launch of the new schedule um, and the uh, the the top of the calendar, if you will, in our in our new schedule um, is the Players' Championship in March, uh, followed by the Masters in April, followed by the PGA Championship in May, then the U.S. Open in June, the Open Championship, which just finished up last week, won by Sean Lowry. Uh, that's in, obviously, July, and then we're looking forward to the crescendo of the season, if you will, our FedEx Cup playoffs. Uh, up next, we're going to start with the Northern Trust um, event at Liberty National, then move on to the BMW Championship at Medina Country Club in Chicago. And then, of course, we're going to finish, as we always do, on the, on the playoff series at East Lake in Atlanta. So more excitement uh, coming up here in, in the next month and looking forward to a great finish to a great, a great year. Uh, moving on uh, to the topic of the day, uh, course conditioning for PGA Tour events. Um, as a audience of, of golf professionals, um, you know, I kind of tried focusing today's presentation on topics that I think would be of, of interest to most. Uh, and when it comes to hosting a event on the PGA Tour and, and course conditioning, I think the most familiar element uh, is green speed. Um, and for those that have have not seen how green speed is measured. The, the photo uh, in this slide uh, shows a volunteer at Murfield Village uh, getting ready to roll a ball off of the 
uh, stent meter, which is that blue steel bar. The stent meter um, has a history that goes back to the mid-1970s. It's called a stent meter because uh, Edward Stimson uh, invented the meter, and then he shared his original prototype with the United States Golf Association and the technical department there at Golf House in Far Hills, New Jersey, actually uh, re-engineered the meter so that it would provide more consistent readings. But very simply, it's a three foot uh, aluminum bar with a uh, notch in which the ball sits. And as you lift up one end of the stent meter, uh, the ball rolls off the end. And then the reading uh, is simply a measurement of how far the ball rolls after it leaves the, the meter. Uh, a pretty pretty simple device, um, you know, no electronics, no lasers, but we think that uh, it gives us actually very good uh, consistent readings that allow us to make decisions about arranging the morning and afternoon maintenance schedules. So the the genesis view of any discussion on green speed is the establishment of a target. Each of our events has a unique uh, target. We 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 don't have the same uh, stent meter target week in and week out. In other words, we we adapt to the circumstances that surround each one of our events. Um, and the, the way that we, we establish the appropriate target for each one of our events is we, we have a equation with uh, five major variables. Um, and I use the acronym SPEED to kind of, of run through them. Uh, and help everyone understand what we're what we're doing. Uh, the The first variable uh, represented by the letter S is the status of the turf. Um, everywhere we go across the globe now, uh, because we we are a global organization, um, we we are working with several different turf grass species that are commonly found on putting surfaces. Um, the major species that we work with on the PGA Tour are uh, Bermuda grass, um, sometimes overseeded, sometimes not. For those of you that are uh, in the uh, low desert there in California, you're certainly familiar with overseeded Bermuda grass. Uh, greens when when we go to other regions of the country, like the southeast region where I'm uh, at today in the great state of Florida, uh, many of the golf courses simply don't overseed during the winter months because they don't they don't have to. So we play on Bermuda grass that's not overseeded at many of our events uh, in Florida. The status of the turf. Um, comes into importance um, when we move around the globe. We also um, obviously are moving through the seasons from winter, spring to summer to ultimately uh, the fall season when we kind of wrap up our wraparound season. Um, as as the temperature changes, um, the the overall fitness of the turf uh, changes, the health status of the turf uh, will changes, and we have to adapt. When we're going to uh, the Midwest in, in the middle of summer uh, and we're playing events on either bent grass or poanya, we have to recognize that they can be under a degree of physical stress caused by high temperatures 
in which case we have to uh, adjust our target. Um, you know, when the when the turf is under stress, we adjust it down. When the turf is in good health and we have good weather conditions, of course, we can feel confident um, raising the stent meter target um, because we you know we feel confident increasing the mowing frequency, increasing uh, the rolling frequency. And second variable is is principal resources. Um, you know, some of our events have large staffs, uh, large equipment inventories, and they have very good, what I would call, infrastructure uh, on the property itself. They have, uh, for example, uh, modern green construction, i.e. USGA green construction, where the green, the core of the green is built out of a readily draining sand, um, stacked on top of a drainage system, which gives superintendents an opportunity to better control soil moisture and, and turf health. Um, other, other sites, um, you know, have older greens that don't drain as well, shorter staffs, smaller equipment inventories. Uh, we need to recognize that we, that we can't do uh, everything we always want to do at those sites. Um, environmental conditions, I think I touched on a little bit already. The weather uh, can have an impact on, on what target speed we establish for events. Um, and on the PGA Tour, I think the last two variables uh, represented by E and D, uh, the expertise of the players, the design of the putting surfaces, um, you know, obviously the, the touring professionals that play on the PGA Tour um, have expert uh, skills and they can adjust to very high step meter readings, whereas, um, you know, average, average golfers have greater difficulty putting on ultra fast greens. Um, and then the design of the putting surfaces, are we, are we, you know, hosting an event on greens that have moderate contours or are we hosting an event that have, that have uh, more substantial contours? Uh, when we have flatter greens, we go with a higher speed. When we have more undulating surfaces, we go with a subdued uh, or lower range speed uh, simply because that gives us an opportunity to uh, make use of the very best hole locations on the putting surface. Um, so th those are the those are the variables that we put into the equation to decide what the target speed should be uh, for each of our events and and it's also I think uh, a good set of variables for every club in America to use uh, to establish the appropriate uh, green speed for their venues. Um, the, the ultimate establishment of the target green speed is not one, is not something that is, that is uh, left to the agronomy uh, staff or the department. Actually, it is, um, you know, a partnership between agronomy and the uh, rules staff for each one of our events. Uh, all of our rules officials are members of the Professional Golf Referees Association. And they're the individuals that have the responsibility of choosing the whole locations for uh, course setup. Um, so, you know, those, those that choose the whole location should have, I think, a very um, large role in determining what the target speed is. So it is, it is a cooperative effort, but ultimately our rules officials are the ones that, that choose the final green speed target uh, for each one of our events. And they primarily use uh, weather uh, expertise of the player and the design of the greens to make a determination. Um, as far as as far as uh, keeping track of green speed during one of our events, uh, I have on the screen some of an example of the data that we collect on a on a daily basis during 
a PGA Tour event. We have uh, volunteers that help us take a stent meter reading on every green, typically in the morning and in the afternoon. And then we establish, if you will, the uh, average of all of those measurements that are, are taken. And it is the average uh, number that we are trying to match up with our target speed. So um, in other words, if our, if our target speed for the event is, is 12 feet, we want the average for all 18 readings taken in the morning to be as close as possible to that, to that target value of, of 12 feet. Um, for, for reasons of managing uh, consistency across the entire 18 hole uh, layout, um, you know, we also keep a keen eye on a couple of other uh, values. We like to keep an eye on the average of the front nine greens, an average of the back nine greens. Obviously, uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, both averages are the same uh, as the average for the entire course. Um, and, and most days, uh, I have to say that the agronomists working with the host superintendents at our PGA tournament venues come very, very close uh, to that target. And, and if you think about it, um, it's kind of a, for me anyway, an extraordinary accomplishment because we're measuring green speed uh, with a, you know, with a very simplistic device, a ball with a notch or a, a 36 inch bar with a notch. Uh, and then we're taking measurements on 18 different greens with you know, slightly different slopes with different uh, wind conditions throughout the golf course, so on and so forth. And and um, amazingly, uh, superintendents are are capable of producing extremely con consistent numbers uh, during the morning shift. In the afternoon, our numbers usually. Uh, for stent meter readings drop a little bit simply because the grass has been growing throughout the day and um, the the consistency between the numbers uh, fades just a little bit um, because sometimes we have whole locations near where we are taking stent meter readings and you get some foot traffic on the putting surface which which causes some disruptions uh, in the uniformity of the surface and of course those uh, minor disruptions affect ball roll when we're taking the stent meter reading. So uh, our numbers our numbers drop a little bit uh, during the afternoon, and then when uh, the maintenance crew goes back out in the in the morning uh, and and mows and rolls, the the greens are essentially reset uh, to the target. So if we look at if we look at what we're doing, not just in a day, but uh, throughout the entire week, uh, and and the week prior to one of our events, across the bottom of this graph, uh, you see a a two a three a four. Uh, that that represents the second day of the week in advance of the tournament, and then as we get to the tournament. T1 is Monday, T2 is Tuesday, T3, uh, et cetera, all the way through Sunday. Very, very typical uh, during advance week, our green speeds are much lower, usually uh, a foot to foot and a half lower uh, at, our, at our tournament sites because that's pretty much what most uh, clubs uh, are doing day in and day out. Their stent meter readings uh, are not as high as most of our our uh, stent meter readings during an event, uh, unless you know it's a it's a good time of year and it's an elite facility with good resources and a lot of manpower for double cutting and rolling. Uh, and then you know once we hit the beginning of tournament week, Monday, Tuesday, 
we like to uh, be at our target for practice rounds so the players get a chance to adjust to the uh, green speed at each one of our venues. And then uh, here on this graph, I showed the, the target uh, values for green speed uh, dropping on T5, which is Friday. Uh, during this particular event, when the data was collected, uh, we had a forecast for strong winds, so the you know so the rule staff decided to uh, change the target for the day. We dropped the the green speed um, for 24 hours by changing the maintenance schedule in the morning, and then once the windy conditions passed, uh, we went right back up to target. So um, the the point being, targets can sometimes change. Uh, during the competition, not by much, but uh, by a little. And when we do so, it's it's generally in response to uh, weather conditions. Looking at green speed throughout the entire year, um, this graph kind of summarizes the average green speed for all of our events uh, through from January to February. Although these events are are listed in alphabetical order, and to make it a little easier to to uh, digest. Uh, essentially, um, you know, our tournament green speed targets fall into uh, ranges, if you will, the upper, middle, and, and lower range. In the upper range, uh, we have tournaments that, you know, play in the 12 and a half to 13. Um, the overall average, I would say, for our events uh, is a green speed of 12, and then sometimes we go lower um, than, than our average, taking into account um, uh, venues that have undulating greens and or windy conditions. I think Kapalua, you know, that hosts our Tournament of Champions in January is probably the best example. They have, uh, they have strong movement uh, in the greens, and and we usually uh, are tasked with managing the golf course during uh, windy conditions, plus 25 uh, mile an hour winds, and and we we lower the target green speed, you know, to try and avoid uh, balls moving uh, in the wind on the on the greens during competition, which can be a very unsettling. Uh, situation. Once we once we kind of uh, have our arms around green speed, uh, having established a target, putting together a, a maintenance schedule that achieves that target, and then working with our rule staff throughout the week to make sure that we're we're on target, um, we next turn our focus to putting surface firmness, which is an element of playability that is of of certain certainly keen interest uh, amongst our touring professionals. Um, they like to play golf uh, on firm putting surfaces. It adds a certain degree of challenge, uh, you, you know, to playing each round. Uh, it's more, uh, from their perspective, enjoyable to play on firm greens than it is on greens that are, that are uh, more receptive. Um, although sometimes we get a lot of cheers from the from the spectators when a ball hits the green and and spins backward, um, it's always nice to 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 hear the fans uh, engaged. But but actually the players enjoy firmer conditions where the ball goes forward instead of of uh, comes back uh, to the front of the green. We measure firmness uh, of the greens with various different devices. Um, the popular uh, devices on the market are the USGA True Firm, which is that green meter uh, on the far right of the screen. Uh, it's a it's a very accurate meter. Uh, it's expensive, and um, you know it is somewhat fickle when we take it on the road uh, each year and and move it from site to site in one of our trucks. So the more durable unit that we use day in and day out is on the left, um, made by Precision. It's just uh, quite simply a, 
uh, golf ball size bearing ball that we drop on the surface of the green from a height of six feet. And then we use that digital gauge shown uh, on the screen. It's actually a depth gauge and we measure the depth of the depression and thereby uh, generate a firmness reading. So the lower the reading, uh, the firmer the green, the higher the reading, the softer the green. Um, and, and we also uh, try to establish targets for firmness at each of our events. Um, and we recognize that unlike green speed, which is uh, a target that tends to stay the same from round one through round four, uh, firmness actually is something that um, generally declines through the week because as we go from a full field to uh, a field cut on Friday afternoon generally, uh, we have fewer players, fewer tee times, fewer hours of competition on the golf course, so superintendents have an opportunity essentially to uh, manage the soil moisture more precisely, um, you know, for to, to, in other words, to kind of clear that up. Um, during round one, when we have 156 players, we have players on the golf course for about 12 hours a day. When we make a cut to 70 players, we have golfers on each of the greens for about six hours a day. So, you know, as we go from round one to round four, um, you know, we go from a lot of time spent on the golf course to less time spent on the golf course. When there's less time on the golf course, the maintenance staff can can uh, sprinkle a little water on the greens just before the the first group, and then catch the greens uh, right behind the last group, and they can they can get by with uh, a lower moisture percentage, thereby generating uh, firmer conditions as the as the competition progress progresses. Um, it's a it's a mild, uh, if you will, uh, progression. It's it's not um, you know significant. We're going from hopefully firm conditions to uh, firmer conditions as opposed to going from from soft to firm. There's not that much variability uh, in in course conditioning during our events. Of course, we measure and manage firmness uh, by uh, a uh, using a soil moisture meter to measure uh, the water content in the soil. Um, here again, we have targets that we try to pay attention to um, for each one of our events. And uh, here we see uh, in information that comes from one of our previous BMW championships, the maintenance staff did an extraordinary job of dropping the average moisture percentage about a half a percent um, each 24 hour period, thereby generating what I thought was some of the most exceptional playing conditions uh, I've ever witnessed at Conway Farms uh, in, in 2017 during the BMW Championship. Um, elsewhere on the course, uh, we have tees, fairways, and approaches. Our, our course conditioning uh, in these areas really um, revolves around uh, increasing the mowing frequencies of these closely mown areas. Typically, uh, tees, fairways, and approaches are mowed two to three times a week um, at clubs across the map. During one of our events on the PGA Tour, uh, all of the closely mown areas are mowed daily. Uh, and and we mow daily at a slightly lower height of cut uh, than than uh, daily maintenance uh, practices, and we're we're doing so to create a nice, crisp, clean, uniform uh, surface for professional competition. And you know, quite honestly, uh, a, you know, a a course condition that looks great on on television for all of our spectators. Uh, the more we the more we mow the fairways, the more uh, crisp 
uh, the appearance of the fairways are on camera, especially, you know, for those events that like to do something special with their mowing patterns, like, for example, Firestone Country Club, when they hosted the World Golf Championship um, in, in uh, previous years, um, they, they like to refer to the mowing pattern on their fairways as the Firestone Plaid. Uh, they mow a, a cross pattern with triplex mowers that is very vivid. Um, and they lay that pattern out very precisely during uh, advance week. And then they, they mow uh, every day in only two directions to generate that checkerboard appearance that so many uh, have become familiar with. The other, the other thing that we're trying to do um, with our closely mown areas as, as much as possible is, uh, again, um, addressing the, the, um, the firmness of the golf course that is, that is so well appreciated uh, by players. We're trying to get the tees, fairways, and approaches as firm as we, as we can. Um, you know, in addition to mowing every day, some of our tournament sites will actually roll fairways to compress the playing surface and, and thereby generating a little bit of, of firmness. But the two, the two major variables in the equation uh, for generating firmness are fairway top dressing and fairway drainage. Um, you know, the more top dressing uh, you can do on fairways, the the thicker the layer of sand that you accumulate as a cap over the native soil at each site. Um, of course, the sand uh, that we use for top dressing uh, is, is a special sand, if you will. It has a particular particle size uh, distribution uh, and particle shape. Uh, and, and the intent is to choose a sand that drains readily. Uh, if we can get moisture to uh, infiltrate the first couple of inches of the soil profile uh, readily, then, then we can, just like we do on putting greens, manage the firmness of the playing surface. Uh, and of course, drainage speaks to that same uh, intent. We want to better manage uh, water as it is moving through the soil profile. We want to get it on and get it out, or get it on and get the excess out, I should say, so that the playing surfaces are as, as firm as possible. Um, course conditioning for rough, um, you, you know, is really more about uh, selecting a height of cut that is appropriate to the competition, um, you know, some of our competitions are with a uh, select group of touring professionals. For example, our World Golf Championship, where we have a limited field of the very best players on the globe. Uh, those individuals, you know, um, can uh, enjoy, uh, they, can, they can perform, they can score on courses that have deeper rough. When we host a pro-am, um, when we have amateurs mixed in with our professionals, obviously we don't want to take the rough height as high and slow down the overall pace of play to the extent where we can't finish our uh, competition in a, in a timely manner. So rough height, I, I guess you could, you could um, you know, draw a parallel to establishing a green speed uh, it's something that changes uh, week over week, depending upon the course, depending upon uh, the field of play, depending upon, you know, what type of, of grass is being managed on the golf course. Uh, and and in, in a typical, in a typical uh, week, the rough is mowed at the very end of advance week. We put up the ropes uh, to keep the spectators uh, off of the uh, fairway corridors and then um, let the rough grow through the remainder 
of the uh, competition or let it grow through tournament week. Now there are times, uh, spring in the Midwest when the, when the rough is growing uh, very vigorously, there are certainly times when we um, mow inside the ropes, uh, usually on Wednesday or Friday, uh, to keep the golf course in in good condition. Uh, bunkers, bunkers, um, you know, we can spend a lot of time on bunkers, um, but the re reality is on the PGA Tour, uh, they're hazards. Uh, we rate them um, and we and we move on. Um, you know, we we want to have uh, even amount of sand across the basin of the bunkers. Uh, we typically redistribute sand uh, as a practice, standard operating practice during advance week to make sure there's no thin spots. But otherwise, we, we rake the sand and, and try to move forward with our uh, other maintenance duties. So it, it's easy to, to spend a lot of time uh, on bunker bunker maintenance um, when you have individuals that are looking for um, you know very consistent conditions they're looking for a good lie in the bunker um, but you know for our venues um, you know we we approach bunkers as a hazard uh, we just try to rake them and and get on with the, the rest of the day to get all this work done it's it would be it would be unfair not to you know tip a hat to our maintenance staffs and and volunteers uh, to to host uh, a PGA tour event takes an extraordinary amount of of manpower uh, and resources and the primary reason for that is we only have two hours for golf course maintenance in the morning. Uh, ahead of competition, two hours at the end of the day after competition. So we really only have a, a four hour work day instead of an eight hour work day. So in, you know, in many situations, um, we like to at least double the size of the maintenance staff during tournament week. Um, if not, if not go a little, a little higher. So if we have a maintenance staff of of 27 to 30, um, we like to try and and get volunteer support from an additional uh, 30 uh, individuals that enjoy working with us during tournament week. Um, what that what that kind of looks like, um, you know, here on the screen is a if you will a standard um, maintenance department. Uh, staff for the uh, warmer climates that have year-round golf. Um, so many of the clubs there in Southern California uh, that I used to work with uh, back in my in my USGA days, I know they would have uh, staffing, you know, at many of the uh, upper caliber courses in the oh 25 to to 30. Um, and then, you know, the more efficient uh, operations, you know, they could be somewhere in the 20 to 25. And then, and then when we get to tournament week, uh, the staffing, as I mentioned previously, tends to grow substantially. So we would go from a, a staff of 27 to 30 to uh, as many as uh, 70 individuals. I've done tournaments um you know large large tournaments where there's a lot of obstacles uh out there on the golf course grandstands uh you know large hospitality areas that require a lot of cleanup uh large parking areas i've done i've done tournaments with as many as 150 uh working on on the golf course morning and afternoon and and here you, you know I've kind of put together uh, or shown uh, shown you a typical maintenance schedule for a PGA Tour event, and you can see some of the um, mowing frequencies. For example, 
uh, right there at the top of the screen, mowing greens. Uh, we, we schedule mowing greens in both the morning and uh, in the afternoon. And sometimes we roll greens in the morning and the afternoon. And sometimes, you know, we'll double cut and roll greens in the mornings and single cut and roll greens in the afternoon uh, to achieve our, our appropriate green speed target. So it's a very intensive, it's a very intensive week uh, to be sure. And along with those larger staffs come, comes a need for more equipment. Um, so most of our, most of our tournament sites, uh, especially ones that are 18 hole facilities, 36 hole facilities generally have a larger equipment inventory. Uh, so it, it, it comes into play a little bit less, but their 18 hole uh, venues um, require a lot of additional uh, mowing equipment, greens mowers, tea mowers, fairway mowers. Uh, and we're very, 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 very fortunate to have great support from our industry partners, the equipment manufacturers that um, sell equipment to the industry, the, you know, the Toro company, the Jacobson company, uh, and of course the John Deere uh, equipment company that is a strong partner with our with our TPC network, they all uh, are very generous uh, in allowing superintendents to use demo equipment during tournament week to to keep up with our our schedules. Year over year tournament preparation, I think we're you know the message here is that we're always trying to uh, find opportunities to fine tune, find opportunities to to make the operation smoother, more efficient, better. So we follow, uh, well, we proceed each event with a, with a pre-tournament checklist uh, where we go through all of maintenance operations and then we follow up afterwards with a uh, agronomy review report um, to, keep, to keep things uh, well organized and, and getting better year over year. And I think any event uh, any venue that comes onto our PGA Tour schedule um, year over year, you know, typically sees an improvement in in infrastructure, an improvement in operations, an improvement in in uh, uh, employee competency, if you will. Once you know, once individuals host a tournament at a very uh, high level, uh, they tend to maintain their their good work habits throughout the year. So that's a that's a nice uh, benefit for all of our event sites. And with that, um, I've been I've been chatting here for a little over 45 minutes. So I want to say thank you to everyone. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to spend a little time. And John, if uh, if you've had a couple of questions come in, I'm certainly happy to to try and answer some of those at this point. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, in terms of maintaining uh, a consistent green speed and firmness from the first group to the last group on a given day, how uh, how delicate is that process in terms of maintaining the same type of uh, uh, playing surface in between groups in terms of adding water during play? Or is uh, can you talk a little bit about how uh, that consistency is maintained yeah. from first group to last group? Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a it's a it's a good question. Sometimes it's it's uh, easier. Sometimes it's more challenging. Um, our our standard uh, operating procedure is to make sure that each of the greens uh, has a sufficient amount of moisture in the soil so that the condition remains consistent from the first group to the last group. Um, of course, when we, you know, when we hit the challenging summer months uh, and we get uh, high temperatures that accelerate moisture loss from the surface of the green um, or winds that accelerate moisture loss uh, from the greens, we want, to, we want to try and avoid serious wilting on the greens that um, would that would change uh, putting conditions significantly. Um, and in, in, those, in, in those instances, um, there many times is an opportunity to check greens in between the morning and the afternoon groups. And, and we, can, 
you know, we can get out in that, in that gap, if you will, check the soil moisture again and where necessary, uh, apply a little bit uh, of water uh, on the greens. But it's, but it's very, very precise. We measure, we measure soil moisture with an electronic meter. Uh, so that you know what we're doing is is uh, accurate, and when we have to go out between groups, it would be uh, spending you know maybe 35 seconds, 45 seconds uh, on the putting surface with a hoe, just touching uh, areas, knobs, if you will, high points in the greens that that might tend to dry out. So the, the way we try to maintain consistent green speed, consistent putting conditions, consistent firmness, they're all kind of one and the same at, uh, at some point, uh, is, to, is to establish a appropriate moisture content uh, in the morning that takes us through the, the last group of the day. And again, sometimes, most times we're able to do that. Sometimes mother nature uh, gets us out there in between the morning and afternoon uh, groups. From region to region, what has been the most difficult uh, difficult area of the country to maintain consistent conditions year to year and uh, day to day? Um, actually, it's not it's not it's not the region. Um, it's the time of year um that 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 comes into play um during the cooler months of the year uh the you know the very shoulder uh seasons if you will the the january uh, february march uh october november december um we have cooler temperatures and the angle of the sun is lower so we get less evaporative loss from the putting surface. So our our putting conditions tend to change less um, as we as we get into the other months. Um, we see more change morning to afternoon. But it's not it's not regional. It's more it's more uh, seasonal. How much influence do the players and the comments they make uh, have on uh, course conditions? Um, of course, we we listen to every comment uh, that comes in from from one of our players. Um, they, they are our members, so you, you know we we make sure that we uh, are listening. Um, but many times, um, the professional staff, uh, the, the agronomists and the rules officials that uh, are on site at each of our events, um, they're ahead of the, of the feedback that we get from the players. I mean, if, if we get feedback from players, it's at the end of the round. Um, they're going to tell us something that generally i think we we already recognize um and we've already begun the process of of change or taking action adjusting uh the morning or the afternoon maintenance schedule or or uh height of cut uh water management whatever it whatever it might be uh so again we 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 listen very you know very carefully um but I think uh, they're they're echoing, if you will, um, what we already uh, appreciate and have are taking action on. Can you talk a little bit? The final question here, Mr. V. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the the difference and the uh, dynamic relationship that exists between the PGA Tour and the four governing bodies of the four majors and and what it's like working with them, creating the conditions for those four major events? Um, good question. Um, you know, each of the, each of the uh, four majors 
Um, you know, they have, if you will, a committee of individuals that is establishing their uh, playing conditions, uh, establishing their heights of cut, establishing their green speed target, um, working on course setup. Um, so there, so there is absolutely uh, an individuality uh, for each one of the events, and um, we at the at the PGA Tour, uh, we have a we have a large staff, you know, for administering uh, events week in and week out in and around the four majors. So we have a lot of we have a lot of talented. Uh, staff members that that are in close communication with the committees that oversee uh, the major events. So it's a it's a in other words, it's a very co collaborative effort uh, at times, um, but also but also uh, every every major event um, you know has their own unique uh, business plan uh, that they you know, uh, keep an eye on and, and follow. So we, we participate, we collaborate uh, with, all, with all parties um, as, as much as appropriate. Um, it's, a, it's a small community, I guess, the game of golf. So, you know, a lot of us uh, are familiar with, with each other's work. Uh, here at the PGA, for example, um, there's a number of individuals that have uh, previously worked for the USGA, like myself. Uh, a couple of rules officials uh, are former uh, USGA employees. So, um, you know, once you're a once you're a member of of one family uh, and you join another, um, those bonds are so strong that they maintain themselves throughout your career. Okay, I have uh, no final. Uh, we have no final que uh, further questions here on the uh, on the Catalyst broadcast this morning, Mr. Vermeulen. Thank you very, very much for your time, expertise, and uh, insight, and, and uh, the preparations you put together for today's uh, for today's Catalyst. Southern California section is very, very grateful for your time. Respectful of that, uh, we do appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen. On the Catalyst broadcast, as usual, there will be a. Uh, 10 question quiz going out here shortly that I will email to you along with a link to the YouTube recording of this morning's catalyst. Feel free to refer to the uh, recording to complete the quiz if necessary. When you're done with the quiz, please return uh, the completed quiz to Sharon Kerfman uh, at PGA headquarters here. It's skerfman at pgahq.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR credit for attending this morning's catalyst. Once again, Mr. Vermeulen, thank you very much for your time. Have a great day, everybody. Take care, and thanks for supporting the Catalyst. Thanks, John. Bye now. Thank you, sir.